Hello everybody and welcome to a beginner's guide to dragonflies and damselflies. I'm James, I'm a learning and engagement officer with Sussex Wildlife Trust and welcome to part four where we're going to be looking at around two thirds of all the damselfly species that can be found in Sussex. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the commoner species of damselflies across Sussex and we're going to start off with a very distinctive group which is the demoiselles. Now, in fact, this fur species is very appropriately named for it is the beautiful demoiselle. Now, these damselflies have a beautifully iridescent body and wings. They really are quite stunning. Now, they're also relatively unusual amongst our damselflies because they're quite butterfly-like uh, in both their appearance and flight characteristics. Now the beautiful demoiselle is a locally common species in Sussex. In fact, our headquarters at Woods Mill are a really good place to spot this damselfly. Outside of Sussex, they're a little bit more widely distributed in the west and the southwest of the country. Now, as well as this beautiful jewel-like body and coloration, they also have iridescent wings. Now, this is actually a unique characteristic of the demoiselles amongst British damselflies. None of the other groups have this. Now as I mentioned they're very fluttering and butterfly-like in their flight. Now I can guarantee that if you haven't seen a demoiselle before and you see one from a distance you are very likely to think that it's a butterfly at first acquaintance. Now this species is quite unusual amongst our damselflies because it does favour fast flowing waters. Now the males are very territorial, you'll often see them perched in prominent positions ready to chase away intruders or dart out to pursue other insects. Now this often leads them to sunbathing within open glades and along open woodland edges. Now this also gives you a really good opportunity to get close to this damselfly but I would say they can be very difficult to approach. In fact, you have to be really careful not to cast your shadow on this damselfly because it will almost certainly fly away. Okay, so we're now gonna move on to our second demoiselle species, which is the banded demoiselle. Now, I'm sure I probably don't need to explain what the defining characteristic is on the male banded demoiselle. It's certainly pretty obvious. Now, again, this is another damselfly that is relatively widespread in the south of England. It's possibly just that little bit more widespread as a whole than the beautiful damsel. Now, once again, it has this dazzling iridescent body, and I really can't overemphasize just how jewel-like the coloration is when the sun is shining on them. They're absolutely incredible, they really are. Now, once again, they have this fluttering, rather butterfly-like flight, but unusually, and in, in comparison to the beautiful demoiselle, they generally have a preference for slower flowing waters. So slow flowing rivers and streams as a whole will suit this demoiselle that little bit more. Now, once again, the males are highly territorial, so they will chase away other insects. Uh, and of course, the male has these very, very obvious banded wings. Now that brings me on to the females, which are just that little bit different. Now, whereas the male beautiful and banded demoiselles are really rather different, the females can be very similar in look and rather difficult to split. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at a few of the main identification features to help you differentiate them. Now, perhaps one of the first things to take note of is the colour of the wings. The female beautiful demoiselle has these very prominent brown wings. The female banded demoiselle, however, has rather green wings that are quite similar in coloration to the rest of the body. Now, in keeping the theme on the wings, you may also want to look at the wing spots. Now, the wing spots on the beautiful demoiselle they're set further back from the end of the wing, whereas on the female banded demoiselle, they're very close to the end of the wing. Now, this might seem like it would be difficult to spot, but this can actually be a key feature for identifying the two species. 
Now the last thing I would look at is perhaps the colour at the end of the abdomen. So on the female beautiful Demoiselle, she has a largely green abdomen with a fairly obvious bronze tip. Now the banded Demoiselle has a rather uniform green abdomen, although she can show elements of this bronze tip as well. Right, so we're now going to move on from the rather iridescent Demoiselles to the rather iridescent Emerald Damselflies. Now, the emeralds, like all of the other damselfly species, have transparent wings, and that of course marks them as something completely different to the two demoiselle species. Now, this is by far and away the most common of the four emerald species. This one is not known as the common emerald, it is just the emerald damselfly. This is the one that you're likely to see pretty much all across the country. Now, this is a species that tends to favour very shallow and still or very slow flowing water bodies. It's a very, very weak erratic flyer. It tends to wobble around and it really typifies that flying matchstick analogy that I keep talking of. Now, this is a species that is going to really blend into the vegetation. Now you might be looking at it and thinking, well, it's green and it's blue, and this is gonna stick out like a sore thumb. But let me assure you, it really won't. This is a species that even when you're watching it, you'll keep losing as it continuously blends into the grasses. Now, it's a species that generally flies in late summer. They tend to peak usually in round about July. Now they have these very elongated wing spots it's well worth looking at these wing spots when you're checking out emerald damselflies because they can be a really good identification feature between the species. Now, unlike many of the damselflies who hold the wings out along the body, the emeralds are from the family known as the spread wings. And quite simply, that is because they tend to hold their wings out at between 45 to 60 degrees from the body. Right, so we're now going to move on to the next of our emerald damselflies, which is the willow emerald. Now, in truth, this is not really a common species. In fact, this damselfly has only really become well established in the southeast of Britain in the last 10 years. However, our headquarters at Woods Mill are a really good place to come and try and find the willow emerald because they do breed on site. Now, this damselfly really does spend time hanging around in trees by the water. And when I say hanging around, it really does hang around. You, you may well see it hanging from trees just over the water. Now, it is also the longest of all the emerald damselflies. You can even see in this picture just how extended the abdomen is. It also has no blue coloration whatsoever. This image does make it look like part of the thorax is a little bit blue, but truthfully it is a trick of the light and it just doesn't have any blue like the others in its group do. Now it also has these pale wing spots that are outlined in black. They are really, really distinctive. And if you can get a close look, there'll be a very defining characteristic. Now it also has a green spur on the side of its thorax. Now this is very unusual amongst the emerald damselflies. It is really the only one of the four to have this obvious spur. It's almost a little bit like the spur that you'll see in some of the blue damselflies, which we'll come to later. Now along with the rest of its family, it also holds its wings spread uh, at about 45 degrees from the body. Okay, so now that we're moving away from the demoiselles and the emeralds, we're also moving away from any British damselfly species that exceed four centimeters in length. So the rest really are very small. Now we're now gonna look at the rather complicated family of blue damselflies. And the very first of these is the common blue. Now I would put quite a lot of money on the fact that many blue damselflies are probably misidentified as common blues. Now, this really is a very abundant species, but the simple fact is you need to take a very careful look at all of the features on blue damselflies to be able to correctly identify them. 
So the common blue is by far and away the most widespread of all. You really can find it almost all over the country. Now, it is tolerant to a very wide range of habitats, and that of course helps to explain its widespread abundance. Now this species, unusually for a damselfly, is actually quite a confident flyer over open water. Now please don't think that means it's going to be hawking around like an emperor dragonfly. It very much isn't, but it is relatively confident for a damselfly. Now it also has a rather chunky body for a damsel. Again, it's no giant, but it is quite a robust species for its type. Now, one of the most prominent features is it has these very chunky, broad blue shoulder stripes, the anti-humeral stripes. Now, the, the main point to know is the fact these blue stripes are wider than the black stripes that surround them. Now, it also has no spur on the side of its thorax. Now, the spur is a very common shared feature amongst many of the blue damselflies. Now, if you see a blue damsel and it doesn't have this spur, what you are looking at is a common blue damselfly. Now, if you happen to be looking at the abdomen from above, you may also see the distinctive marking on segment two. Now, I like to think of this as a mushroom cloud. Now, it might not look exactly like a mushroom cloud, but let's be honest, you're not going to forget that in a hurry. Okay, so we're now going to move on to the second of our more common blue damselfly species, and that is the azure damselfly. So the azure is very similar to the common blue, and it is almost certainly the species that is most regularly confused with it. Now, on having said that, the azure and the common blue, they do have some rather different identifying characteristics, which we're going to go over now to help you to split the two. So the azure damselfly is the other common blue species. You can find this species over almost the whole of the country. Now, it's a little bit earlier flying than the common blue. So the azure damselfly you will often see on the wing in spring, whereas the common blue is rather more a damselfly of the summer. Now, the azure has a more delicate, sort of flimsy looking body. It just doesn't have the robustness of the common blue. Now, if you look at the markings between the eyes, the azure has these two really obvious blotches of color. However, it doesn't have a color bar between these blotches. And that is actually quite an important feature because that color bar is distinct in a number of blue damselfly species. Now, if you were to look at the shoulder stripes, you would find that the azure damselfly has rather narrow blue shoulder stripes. So it has narrow blue stripes surrounded by thicker black stripes. In contrast, if you remember back to the common blue damselfly, it has thick blue stripes surrounded by narrower black stripes. Now, the azure damselfly also exhibits the diagnostic spur on the side of the thorax. Now, bear in mind, this spur is shared by all members of the same genus, However, it is not exhibited by the common blue damselfly. So this feature is really diagnostic. Now, if you do manage to get a good look at the top of the abdomen, once again, take a look on segment two and you will see a very, very distinct marking. So of course, where the common blue damselfly had what I would describe as a mushroom cloud, the azure damselfly has a big black U. And what you can do is think of the U in the word is year, and that's the marking it has on the abdomen. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna recap some of the key identification features to try and help you remember the differences between azure and common blue damselfly. Now, looking at the top of the thorax, try to remember the azure has thin blue stripes, but thick black stripes. The common blue damselfly has thick blue stripes, but thin black stripes. Now this spur, of course, again, is absolutely diagnostic. So whereas the azure damselfly exhibits the spur on the side of the thorax, the common blue damselfly does not have it. 
Now, moving on to the abdomen, bear in mind that the azure damselfly has that big black U on the segment two, whereas of course the common blue has the mushroom cloud. Now, I do apologize for not having an overhead view of this mushroom cloud, but what I would suggest is get out there into the field, find yourself a common blue damselfly, and check out that mushroom cloud for yourself. Now, the last thing was the eyes, the markings in between the eyes. So do try and check as to whether it has a thin color bar between the two blue blotches. That color bar can signify a rarer species of blue damselfly, but please also be aware that the common blue damselfly does also show this feature. Okay, so we're now gonna move on to another damselfly with blue in the name, and this is one of the two blue-tailed damselfly species. Now, this one, just called the blue-tailed, is by far and away the commoner of the two. In fact, it really is one of the commonest UK damselfly species. This one you're gonna see almost all over the country. Now, to that end, it really is found in so many different habitats. It really can tolerate all sorts of different conditions, uh, whether that be acidic or brackish water. It is very, very adaptable indeed. Now, this damselfly has a very a typical jerky erratic flight. It tends to sway around like a little pendulum. It really does look quite unstable. Now this is a species that you will actually probably see mating because it seems to spend an awful lot of time doing it. In fact, you'll probably see these pairs in the copulation wheel position really quite frequently. Now, of course, the naming of the blue-tailed damselfly says it all. It has a really, really dark abdomen with a very distinctive blue tip. There will almost certainly be enough to identify this species in itself. Now, it also has these very elongated two-tone wing spots that are really rather distinctive. Now, the last thing I would say is, although the males tend to be relatively consistent in coloration, the female actually has a number of different color forms. This will usually relate to these stripes on the thorax, and you may well see her in green or brown or pink or violet. So there really are some very distinct color varieties. Now, I'm sure you're all thoroughly fed up with the blue damselflies. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch colors and we're gonna change to the red damselflies instead. To that end, we're gonna look at the large red damselfly, which is relatively appropriately named because it is of course red and it is large-ish. Although I would say that Largeness is definitely a relative term when it comes to damselflies. Now, in fact, this is only really known as the large red because it happens to be bigger than its appropriately named cousin, which is the small red damselfly. Now, this is also one of the very commonest dragon or damselfly species in Britain. You can see this almost anywhere. Although it has a general preference for slower flowing water, it will survive in almost any wetland habitat. Now, it's also a very early emerging damselfly. So this is a species that you'll usually see from March, which is significantly earlier than any other species. Now, for such a small thing, they're surprisingly feisty, and actually the males are really quite territorial. So they will launch themselves from perching positions in order to attack other insects. Now, having said that, they're also really quite easy to approach. So actually, this damselfly should give you really good photographic opportunities. Now, unlike their relative, the small red, the large red has completely black legs, which of course are in stark contrast to the color of its abdomen. Now, the male has these very, very distinctive red shoulder stripes. So that's something quite nice to look out for. And they really contrast with the bronze thorax. Now the female, in much the same manner as the blue tailed damselfly, she also has a few different distinct color forms. So it is worth taking note of that when you're looking at this damselfly as it may cause confusion.
Okay, so the very last species of damselfly we're going to look at is the red-eyed damselfly. So unlike the large red damsel, which had red eyes and a red body, this species has red eyes and a blue body. So it is, in essence, a combination of red and blue damselfly. Now, this is a species that is fairly abundant in the southern half of Britain, so Sussex can actually be a really good county to spot it. Now, it very much favours larger bodies of water, lakes and gravel pits, but it is a relatively weak flyer. Now, most of the time, you'll have to look for it on floating vegetation, particularly on water lilies, so you really might need your binoculars to see this species. Now, Again, for a tiny little damselfly, it is very, very territorial. And actually, the males will often fly out from their lily pads in order to defend these prime pieces of territory. Now, it has these deep burgundy red eyes, really quite unmistakable. And it also has this very obvious spur on the side of its thorax in much the same manner as some of the more typical blue damselflies. Now also, if you look on top of the thorax, it also has this rather prominent bronze tinting. Okay, so that brings part four to conclusion. And in total, that is exactly half the dragonflies and damselflies you're most likely to encounter in Sussex. Now, hopefully in a future presentation, I'll be able to cover the other half, all of which are somewhat more localized in their distribution. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you've enjoyed it. And it's a goodbye from me for now.